Thank you for joining this webinar. I hope you can all hear me uh, clearly. My name is Mark Windle, Head of Marketing at OpenCloud. In the next 25 minutes or so, I'd like us to uh, take a look at how the real-time communications landscape has changed uh, and how operators must also change in order to succeed. I hope that uh, you'll find this presentation uh, thought-provoking. If you have any questions, uh, then please use the, the webinar tool to submit them, and I'll spend some time towards the end of the presentation answering a few of them. Uh, any that are left over unanswered, I will uh, address offline after the event. So we're looking at the future of real-time communications, and where better to start than two and a half thousand years ago. So 500 BC, uh, Greeks famous for their philosophy, the only constant is change. It seems like probably the most apt way to describe today's telecoms market. So we're going to have a look at what's driving the change and what this change means for telecoms operators. The industry, the telecoms industry, has been talking about convergence for some time. The coming together of IP networks, the internet, and telephone networks. And it's been happening. It's been happening fairly slowly over the last decade. But more recently, there have been a coupling of two, uh, two other events that have triggered uh, an explosive rate of change. And I'm talking here uh, about the launch of uh, mobile broadband um, from uh, the 2.5G, uh, 3G in particular. And this, this evolution is making data services uh, more ubiquitous. And at the same time, and intricately linked with this, is the increasing availability and penetration of smartphones and their capabilities to use ubiquitous data to offer consumers new services from their mobiles. This convergence, the, the mixing together of IP and legacy networks, has created a broader context for communications. It has introduced uh, a greater diversity of possibilities. We've added the capabilities of the internet and capabilities of the smartphone to the existing capabilities of the telecoms network. But this is all new territory, and we're seeing much more rapid evolution as the industry finds and tests out new ideas and evolves new ways to exploit this, uh, this broader array of possibilities. So in short, this convergence, which has rapidly accelerated, is creating opportunity, which is great news, but for who? There's also been a lot of discussion recently, since this uh, convergence has accelerated, about the, the OTT players, the over-the-top players that are providing services uh, over the top uh, of the, the data connections and encroaching on the telecom or operator's space, particularly uh, in relation to uh, um, the real-time communication services. It seems like the OTT players have managed to seize the initiative here, and they're, they're the leading explorers in the new converged market. If we, if we have a think about that, like, like many internet companies, they, they can be quicker to move, able to experiment with new ideas, finding those that work and kind of weeding out those that don't. Their services are more shaped by the market, therefore, um, because they evolve with the market and change as the market changes. Now, as part of a contrast to that, um, at the top of the slide there, um, I've put a little timeline. Um, and I think this, uh, this exemplifies the problem within telecoms. But within telecoms, we have an approach of using standardization, which effectively defines what the products will be capable of. And therefore, eventually, it defines what will be offered to the market. Um, and, and in essence, 
this means that what's taken to market is effectively five years behind what the market's doing currently. <clears throat> with today's pace of change, um, with these OTT players operating much more rapidly, uh, much more flexibly and dynamically, telecoms operators just can't afford to give this new breed of competitor a five-year head start. And uh, you know, especially if we look at the forecasts like this from Analysis Mason, you know, we're seeing that the operators' revenues are are going to be eaten away. They're already being eaten away, and that's set to continue. And this is a problem. Uh, it's a problem because voice revenue is rather important. One of the things that troubles me um, is there's a bit of an unhealthy focus on data within the industry. And by that, I don't mean that there shouldn't be a, um, a discussion about data. Clearly, data uh, and LTE are going to be hugely important in the future of telecoms operators. But for me, what's troubling is it's the degree of focus. Um, and that's unhealthy because really there's a lack of consideration, or appears to be a lack of consideration, about the value that still exists in real-time communication services, such as voice. You know, we've just seen a forecast that shows that these revenues are under threat. And for a typical operator, um, you know, these revenues represent two-thirds of their income. So it's clearly fairly important to find a way to protect that, even grow that uh, revenue stream. But it's not for everyone. I think a lot of operators are facing a decision. They need to decide whether they want to be a data pipe supplier and whether that's a, a dumb pipe or a smart pipe is perhaps a, a secondary decision. Or if they're not going to be just a data pipe provider, they have to decide whether they want to deliver services such as real-time communications like they have done in the past. For those that do want to defend and build on their existing voice revenues, the future has got some interesting possibilities. We're already seeing some operators roll out their own uh, voice over, over IP services. Uh, HD Voice is also being rolled out in uh, um, increasing numbers, um, <clears throat> either separately or as part of the voice over LTE rollout. Video over LTE, you know, we've, uh, as an industry, we've dabbled with uh, or at least discussed video services at the launch of 3G. Here we are a whole generation later. Is it going to be this time? Certainly the OTT uh, um, services like Skype uh, are doing fairly well at providing video services. As we've uh, seen earlier, RCS is now uh, a reality. How's that going to go? Web RTC, that's the big unknown. It's uh, on the horizon there. Um, so how do, how, do we, how do the network operators need to deliver um, these services to satisfy the future market? Which of these are really going to be the winners and which are the losers of the future? What else is going to come along that needs to be added to this list of real-time communication opportunities? What's the future of real-time comms? Where is the future? Well, let me tell you. Nobody knows. I think many vendors at this point would, would go off and give a long spiel about uh, where they see it and why it's uh, going in one particular direction, which just happens to fit the uh, direction of their product set. But sorry, nobody really knows what the future is. We can see that uh, Convergence is creating this opportunity. It's creating this broader context for telecoms. But the landscape is moving so fast, so dynamically, and it's ever-changing. Predicting which services will be winners and losers, losers is, is full of uncertainty. The future itself is full of uncertainty. So if we're asking what does the future look like, then I think we're asking the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, so what is it that the network operators need to do in order to turn this uncertain opportunity 
into revenue. And for that, I think we have some answers. The current landscape is moving fast and it's constantly changing. These conditions are the norm in the internet world, but they now define the converged telecoms world. The over-the-top players from the internet um, have already evolved the characteristics that enable them to flourish on the internet in these sorts of conditions. So perhaps it's not a surprise that they're doing fairly well um, in the converged telecoms market as well. In order to address this fast-moving, constantly changing uh, set of opportunities that exist in, the, in today's market, the network operators need to be fast, not lagging five years behind, but closely following the market, or even leading it. They need to be agile. They need to be able to change as the market changes, to follow new ideas as they emerge. They've got to have the capacity to follow multiple opportunities. No one really knows which are going to succeed and which fail. And having the, cap the capacity uh, and the, fr uh, the freedom to do that is essential. And they mustn't be constrained in which they can follow and which they can't. Um, again, no one knows which will succeed, which won't, and then each operator will want to follow their own path. So these characteristics, these are the foundation characteristics needed for the future within telecoms. Unfortunately, uh, the traditional approaches we see in telecoms don't support these characteristics. The telecoms industry's traditions are holding network operators back. So what must the operators change in order to successfully deliver real real-time communication services for the future. Obviously, some of the new required characteristics require a change of mindset. However, the way in which these services are implemented also needs changing. And here we see that the service layer has a role to play. The service layer is, is where the real-time comm services are delivered in the network. It controls how they work, uh, it provides the logic that, uh, that controls the execution, and it determines how the services are, uh, are charged, which points or which actions within the service generate chargeable events. So this concept, the service layer concept, exists in legacy networks and in the next generation of converged networks. And it Conceptually, it's delivering the services for voice, video, messaging, and data. It's uh, enabling interaction with uh, external applications through exposed APIs. And obviously, it's uh, enabling interaction with the charging systems to, uh, to monetize those services. The real-time services of the future will also be delivered from within this conceptual model. It's therefore critical that the service layer supports those characteristics needed to chase the fast-moving, ever-changing opportunities. So this is a nice, clean, uh, conceptual view of the service layer as a single functional block. In reality, however, it's typically implemented quite differently. The traditional approach to implementing uh, new services in the service layer is through the deployment of a succession of equipment. So basic voice services may have been deployed using one vendor's SS7 intelligent network, perhaps an SCP with some uh, associated uh, peripherals, such as voicemail platforms. And then prepaid. Prepaid services might have been deployed from a separate vendor on a separate IN platform. Prepaid roaming, possibly on another platform, enterprise services on another or several more, and so on. In each case, the functionality of the vendor's platform 
would be based on their their standard product, um, and that's the same standard product that uh, they're supplying to all the operators, um, and therefore to the operators' competitors. It would implement the same standards, of course, as all other similar products as used by all other operators. Uh, it might have some proprietary extensions, of course, and it would uh, probably have some additional features that are uh, added in by the vendor uh, based on what the vendor believes are needed for the future. But it's not a recipe for differentiation. And the vendor has decided what's important for the future, not the operator. If the operator wants something different, then a further issue arises with this model. These platforms are closed. Only the vendor can change them. So the vendor has control over the costs and time to market of new features. It's a, it's a pseudo monopolistic situation that makes innovation and change expensive and slow for the operator. So the traditional approach appears to be inflexible. It looks like it's slow uh, and expensive to adapt and it's uncompetitive. And when we speak to our customers, they tell us that this indeed is the situation. But the biggest problem here is the root problem, that the vendor is in control. The key change that we see is that network operators must put themselves back in control of the service layer if they're to succeed in the future. To do this, operators need to break with the tradition of deploying additional closed silos for new services. The, uh, the service layer um, needs to span across the legacy SS7 network and the next generation IMS network. By doing this, it, it will enable innovation to draw from uh, both and also serve the, the consumers on both. Um, the rollout of the next generation network is one thing. The migration of customers from legacy to next generation is something else. And we see both networks are going to uh, persist for some time to come, decades even. So being able to work across uh, both legacy and next generation within a single platform is important. It provides the basis for uh, richer innovation. On top of that, we also need to have connection into uh, um, internet services through the API, as I was mentioning earlier. However, the critical change is to break away from the closed nature of the traditional solutions. The service layer needs to be open. And by this, we mean it's got to be open so that anyone can develop new services within the service layer platform. The, this open approach, uh, allowing um, open development, uh, is something that you know, we've seen already through the APIs, um, uh, particularly you know, when, when we look at uh, the, um, the Apple uh, App Store model or <clears throat> The, the Android market, you know, there's the model there is the same. You open things out uh, and you have a, a richness of um, supply of development uh, skill coming to bear. The same can be done within the telecoms network. Not, not quite so broadly, but still you can attract in a larger number of development uh, suppliers. And with this wider choice of development suppliers, comes a wider, broader, free market of supply. Uh, and this means that the operators can now get development supplied at a competitive price. It puts them back in control. They can determine what they want, the functionality they want, and they can have the freedom to choose a supplier that can deliver that functionality at the right price and in the right time frame. So by opening it out, by enabling a broader uh, ecosystem of developers, helps reduce the cost 
and time to market for the operator. So, and, and that's good in general, um, but it's also critical if you want to have the freedom to try out new ideas, to be a bit more innovative and adventurous. The, uh, the reason is um, that by having this larger pool of developers, the larger ecosystem, it means you have a larger uh, stream of ideas and source, uh, a broader source of innovation. Uh, and the, you know the developers can take their innovative ideas to the network operator, um, or the network operator indeed can uh, um, work with them to uh, to develop new concepts. This enables the network operator to to find the new opportunities uh, and try them out. And because the cost is reduced and the time to market is uh, reduced, the the overhead of of trying new ideas. Um, is not prohibitive like it used to be. Of course, if the platform's open for anyone to develop on it, then it means the, the operator themselves can develop on the platform. And in that way, they can take full control of how they exploit new opportunities. So by opening the service layer, moving from a model where it's closed to where it's open, means that uh, th there's greater flexibility. It's quicker to adapt to market conditions. The cost of innovation can be reduced. Uh, and all this enables greater differentiation and um, also a more competitive pr position. Breaking with the traditional approach of deploying individual closed silos and replacing that with an open service layer makes the critical change. It puts the network operator in control. So, 20 minutes uh, ago, I talked about uh, change being constant. Um, we looked at uh, how communications is evolving and what's driving that. I think the, the future of real-time communications is really quite exciting. And it's exciting because we've seen this convergence is creating new opportunities. Um, but it's also exciting because the market's moving fast. It's constantly changing. It's creating uncertainty. Today, we're seeing OTT competitors eating into the operator's core services. They have speed, agility, and freedom these foundation characteristics that, that, that the operators need to emulate. If they're to retain leadership in real-time communications, the operators must uh, acquire those traits of speed, agility, and freedom. And to do that, they obviously have to change. They need to change the service layer. The service layer provides the foundation for the, uh, the real-time services. And by changing the service layer to an open service layer, it can provide the foundation for quick, agile, and unrestricted evolution of real-time communication services. And it puts the operator back in control. So if network operators really want to change uh, in order to succeed in the converged future, They've got to break free from the tr traditional approaches that hold them back. And uh, only by losing the chains can they take the lead. So that's the end of uh, the presentation. I hope you found it interesting. I'm interested to hear if you agree, uh, or interested to hear where you uh, would like to challenge uh, my views. Uh, of course, I'm happy to take uh, questions to explore this any further. So I have uh, a couple of questions here, um, which uh, I'll uh, start with. So am I suggesting network operators can beat the OTT players? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't see them beating OTT entirely. I think 
I think OGT is here to stay. Um, but I think if the operators can change and have acquired uh, the ability to move quickly and with agility, and they have the control of their their own service evolution, uh, you know, I do believe that they can effectively retain the dominant position they currently have. And I think quite importantly, I think they can still draw um, draw significant revenue from voice and other real-time communication services. Uh, a second question. Thank you for this. Um, if the traditional approach is so wrong, why do operators stick with it? Yeah, that's a good question. Old habits die hard, I think. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we go back, I think the old model used to be sufficient. That, you know, in the good old days of telecoms, um, when, uh, when all your com competitors are effectively developing the same standards um, and developing with the vendors, deploying the same or, or, or similar vendors' equipment and delivering kind of largely undifferentiated services to a growing market. I think, you know, if, if it, all the consumers are being offered the same thing, but the market's growing, it still works. You know, everyone's still making more and more money. But, you know, today, many of the markets are saturated. Um, but I think more importantly, there's, there's new competitors. And it's these new competitors that have emerged that uh, follow a very different model. They follow the internet model, uh, not the traditional telco model. And I think I think this is the the, the, the one of the biggest um, aspects of the change that uh, uh, means the old approach is wrong. You know, these new OTT players do things very differently. Um, you know, and against that new competition, the old way is just ineffective. You know, they're, they're outpacing the telcos, they're more agile. Um, yeah, so, so I think for that reason, um, the new model is needed. So um, I have time for one more question. Um, So, given, uh, sorry, um, here we go. Doesn't this approach require a broader ecosystem of end devices, which might take longer for operators to build? Um, thank you for the question. It, it really depends, actually. Uh, I think, um, in, in essence, no. We're talking about the network evolution here. We're talking about stuff in the heart of the network um, so in many in many senses there's still evolution to be had um, with 2g voice services um, you know there's plenty of things that could have been done that haven't been done uh, simply because the uh, the equipment in the network was inflexible so in one sense it's not about the uh, the end devices I think, however, and I think this is perhaps where your question comes from, is the fact that we have uh, capabilities on the handset now which marry with capabilities uh, on the internet. Um, it's the classic model, uh, going through a dumb pipe in between over the mobile network uh, um, themselves. But the, the mobile networks have value to add in that. And actually by combining all those three, compart three components which exist today, and therefore doesn't require additional devices. That, that, that's the converged model. That, that's where a lot of the richness comes from with the opportunity. And I, I think that is, um, like I said, something that, that exists there today. It doesn't require new devices. Yes, new devices will come along. You know, we'll see devices that are, uh, are much more integrated and Particularly, I think WebRTC is going to be a huge uh, um, 
collection of changes in itself. But fundamentally, the capability of being able to add the capability of the uh, devices to the capability of the internet, add that and mix that in with the capabilities of the networks, and within the network itself, harness those to innovate new services. I think if the operators can, date, can, can gain the control of that, um, so that they can innovate for themselves without being dependent on, on vendors, then I think, uh, as I said, that uh, they can certainly retain leadership in real-time communications. That's, uh, that's all I have uh, time for um, today. I really appreciate the questions that have come in. For those that I haven't answered, I will, um, I will post uh, um, answers online uh, after this event. And um, as a final, uh, final word, I'd just like to thank Computaris for hosting this webinar, and I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you.